you're in for a real treat this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Dr. Julia Shaw to Virtual Futures. My name is Luke Robert Mason. I'm the director of Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid 90s. And to code its co-founder, co it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, what is most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as the, uh, as the Guardian put it. Its actual aim, hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and to begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. I am uh, blessed to be joined by psychological scientist Julia Shaw this evening. Nobody has done more in furthering the public communication of science behind the darker side of humanity than Julia. Best known for her work in areas of memory and criminal psychology, her first book, Memory Illusion, taught us that we're all incapable of trusting our own recollection. And now she's back to tell us that we all might be a little bit evil. But that's okay. Her new book, Making Evil, challenges the dehumanization that's embedded in labeling someone as evil and explores our cultural and cognitive reactions to villainy. So, to uncover humanity's dark side, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Julia Shaw to the Virtual Futures stage. So... Julia, I have to ask, how did your work in false memory lead you to writing about evil? Oh. So for those of you who aren't familiar with my first book, um, I spent most of my PhD convincing people that they committed crimes that never happened. So I studied what are called false memories, memories of experiences that feel real, that are emotional, that are multisensory, that are complex, but that didn't actually take place. And what I wanted to show is how easy it is to create basically a criminal out of thin air, out of memories. And in that particular study, the criminal, if you will, was the person themselves. So the person I was implanting the memory into who was the participant. Now the reason I did this was actually to show how easy it is through leading and suggestive interviews to convince people of these fictional realities. How easily potentially we can shift people's sense of self and identity, what they think they're capable of, what they think they have done. And so based on that and after publishing that book, I, I regularly got prison from uh, prison, <laughs> mail from prison, prison from mail, uh, mail from prison. Uh, and sometimes people would say to me that they were uh, either falsely accused of a crime. Some of this, of course, you might not give as much weight to when it's coming from someone who's currently in prison. Uh, but we also do know that there are people who are wrongfully convicted of crimes. We know that people are on death row, for example, or have been on death row in the past who didn't belong there and who are exonerated sometimes decades later. So we know that wrongful convictions happen. We know that most often bad memories or in particular faulty eyewitness identification, but sometimes also in 25% of them false um, confessions play a huge role. So memory is a core piece to why people sit in prison who shouldn't be sitting there and why people confess to crimes they didn't commit. Now what this has to do with evil is that we're creating basically monsters through leading interviews or people perceive themselves or believe themselves to be monsters. And on the other hand, uh, it, it just showed how reality can really be messed with and how we need to be very careful with that. And we need to be careful not to dehumanize ourselves and others through biased psychological processes. There's one particular letter that you received that you describe mm. in the book of a gentleman who falsely remembers killing his father, or at least falsely remembers the reasons why he did. Correct. So this was a fascinating case. I got a letter, and usually letters from prison are very long. Uh, they are often... 
not written in the most eloquent manner. And this letter wasn't like that. This letter, I arrived at my office at the university and I opened it and it was beautifully written and it was eloquent and it was obviously an educated person who had written this letter. And he claimed that he had murdered his elderly father. He had no criminal record before this and he'd overkilled him. So he'd stabbed him dozens of times and he did it, he says, because he had this flood back of memories of being abused and childhood by his father. Now, immediately after it happened, he says, I don't think this happened. I don't think that the monster who I thought my father was, which made me, if you will, into a monster to kill him, I don't think that person existed. And so I acted out out of a false memory. So he claims that because he was undergoing therapy for alcoholism, his, the social workers who were trying to help him kept suggesting to him that there must have been something terrible that happened when he was younger, which made him into an alcoholic. And he kept saying, no, no, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't. But at some point he says, I believed them. And then it led to this terrible crime. So he's currently in prison in the UK and he's not denying that he murdered his father. He did, and he did it intentionally. But he, he actually asked, he, he said, can you send me a copy of your book? Because um, it's not available in the prison library. If you have books and you want to donate to prison libraries, by the way, that's a whole system, a whole ecosystem uh, of people who have a lot of time and need more books to read. Yeah. So well, let's talk about this, this idea of evil, because what you're really doing in this book is trying to challenge what we mean when we say evil. When we talk about the word evil, it's a very almost subjective experience or a subjective idea of what we think evil is. Yeah, I mean, I, in the book, I actually don't define evil because I think it would take a whole book to define evil. Um, that's the next one. That's yeah. <laughs> defining evil. Pro yeah. Defining evil. What is evil? Uh, making evil is actually a reference to a Nietzsche quote, uh, which is thinking evil is making evil, which is the idea that evil is a subjective construct that we create. And I would go as far as saying that the concept of evil probably only exists in our fears. And so we label something evil when we don't want to understand it, when we don't want to empathize with a human being, when we effectively want to write off a human being in their entirety and say they're so different than we are that we don't need to bother trying to understand them. And so I think that, that dehumanizing piece, that's when we use the word evil most often. And that's what we need to be incredibly careful with because I think it's very easy to do terrible things, things that we might label ourselves evil if we saw other people do them, in the name of, quote, fighting evil. So we need to be careful that we're, we don't become, if you will, the monsters we think we're fighting. Well, this is, this is the issue you have. It's the, the dehumanization of labeling. And it's not just the word evil, it's the word murderer, thief, liar, pedophile, monster, all of these things you see as problematic uh, signifiers for certain people who've done bad acts. What's so problematic about labeling someone as any of those things? I think we need to be very careful with labels. Now, one of them was a little bit different in there, pedophile. There I'm more, uh, we could talk about that a bit later, but there it's more about getting the concept wrong most of the time. It's more that we use labels um, like murderer to oversimplify a human being. We try to capture their whole essence and we pretend that one act suddenly defines them, which it doesn't, which if, if you think of the worst thing you've ever done, and now you thought that everybody knows about it and everyone is constantly calling you just by this label, and doesn't think about the rest of your humanity, you would say, well, that's absurd. That doesn't capture me. That's the worst moment in my life. That is, that is the worst part of me. And maybe that was 20 years ago. Maybe, that was, maybe it was yesterday. But it can't possibly capture your complexity. And yet with other people, we do that quite readily. And we use these labels to oversimplify and dehumanize them and to just basically reject the context and the nuance of what actually makes people do the things they do. Well, do we do that because of our own insecurity? We, we feel like we have to other that person so that we're going, look, we're not anything like them. Yeah, I think most often that is exactly right. I think quite often we, we're worried potentially about what we are capable of. I think it's easy or easier to think of ourselves as good people most of us think that we are good people. We don't usually def use the word evil to define ourselves, even if we've done terrible things. Um, we reserve that word for others. And I think that is a really important piece of it, is that we, we do try to create this artificial distance. 
And we look at war criminals and we say, I could never. And we look at people who've committed murder and say, I could never. And we look at rapists and say, I could never. But some of us are doing these things, some of us have done these things, and some of us are going to do these things. We need to make sure we're looking at ourselves and not saying, I could never, but when might I? so that we can prepare ourselves for situations that might lead or contribute to us doing those kinds of things and hopefully stop ourselves from engaging in them. Well, well this is also issue with dividing the world into that dichotomy of good guys and, and bad guys. It's something we do from childhood. I'm actually, I'm tempted to write a children's book because I think from little onwards, we're taught that there's good guys and bad guys and, or good humans and bad humans. Um, and it's, it's this black and white thinking that takes us everywhere. And it's, it's this overly simplistic, really lazy way of approaching the world. And I think that actually there's so much more interesting, psychological, scientific, the reasons for why we engage in stuff are so much more interesting than just that person is evil. I mean, that, that, that's not interesting at all as far as I'm concerned. What's far more interesting is, you know, but what led them to this point? Which is also why I think we are fascinated by things like true crime. Why we like watching Dexter or psychopaths, fictionalized psychopaths on TV, where the idea is that the protagonist is carrying us along with their mind and how it works. And, and we do have a fascination there. A sort of, let, let's take a look what's going on in there. But then we can step, take a step back again and go, oh, no, 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 but I'm not like that. Well, we're perhaps going to talk a little bit about the Netflix trend for, for murderers in a second, but how do you approach the critique that what you're doing in the book is essentially creating some sort of evil empathy or empathy for evil people? Well, it's not just a critique. It's what I ask for. Well, <laughs> is, there, is there an issue with doing that? Um, I, I get asked uh, quite often uh, whether I am excusing wrongdoing, and the answer is absolutely not. So I think to explain is not to excuse. I think we urgently need to try and explain and understand why we all are capable of doing terrible things. And I think that if we don't do that, we risk being vulnerable and we, we risk engaging in those things more. So I think it's desperately time to explain, but it is definitely not time to excuse. And so I think that ultimately, certainly from my perspective, we are free agents, we have a d the decision-making ability to you know, do something bad or not do something bad. And sure, there's lots of contexts and factors that make us doing something harmful to another individual more likely. But that doesn't mean that we're off the hook when we choose to engage in that bad behavior. And so I think that's possibly the most important piece is that none of this, none of this book is trying to sort of explain away bad things. It's trying to explore what actually is this darkness, where does it come from, how do we understand it, and how do we prevent it? Are you finding, given the current cultural environment that we live in, are you finding people having visceral reactions to being asked to have empathy for certain types of evil people, especially in the age of the Harvey Weinsteins and the, the Bill Cosbys? I mean, are you finding real difficulty in trying to get people to understand the nuances of what you're trying to say in this book? I have actually been surprised by the overall positive response. I think there are people who are not willing to engage in critical thinking around their fundamental belief systems. And that includes difficult conversations. I mean, this book is basically going from one taboo topic to another, and that's by design. The whole thing is made to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, and that's because... It's an uncomfortable read if anybody <laughs> wants to purchase one. <laughs> but it's also fun, hopefully, and interesting, and an exploration. I mean, I, I do venture in and out of sort of lighter topics, like cute aggression. Like, why do we sometimes want to squeeze babies really hard? And does that have anything to do with being a bad person? Or, you know, oh, what, what, what is this? Is it even aggression? up to murder, then back to kinky Philia. things. Oh, well, kink, and kink. then pedophilia. Yeah, yeah okay. kink that a lot of us engage in, so that more than half of the population to some extent engages in, up to pedophilia, up back to, I mean, it really is intentionally trying to go in and out of everyday, I call it everyday evil, but it's everyday experiences and feelings and trying to get to know ourselves, up all the way as far as I can push it. And where are those boundaries? And at what point do we need to be careful? I mean, why is there such a taboo of talking about these sorts of topics? They're, they're, they're hard to talk about. I mean, when I 
tell you to empathize with a pedophile or to try to understand why people sexually abuse children. That's a hard thing to think about. I mean, it even th so there's a whole chapter on pedophilia in this book, basically trying to deconstruct the misconceptions that most of us have about this. And again, not trying to excuse, but trying to understand and explain that this is a permanent fixture of human society. And if we don't get our shit together, kids are going to continue to be at risk. And basically it's because adults are too scared to talk about it, which I think is devastating. Well, you call that curiosity shaming. Curiosity what, what, shaming. What is curiosity shaming? Seeing things like we need to talk about pedophilia to keep our kids safe. And someone saying, no, pedophiles are monsters. They all deserve to go to prison or we should kill them as if that was a viable solution. Um, and basically saying, even worse, what are you saying? Are you a pedophile? I mean, it goes, it goes very quickly into basically trying to shame the person who's trying to engage in that empathy exercise and say, well, does that mean that's what you are? Which, of course, is basically a, a social ostracizing behavior. It's trying to shame that person away from that topic, even though and that's my argument, is that those are the, the things that are hardest to talk about are probably the things we most need to talk about. I mean, the, the, the other issue comes with how do you respect the victims of certain crimes yeah. and also talk about this sort of subject matter? I mean, I think in talking about trying to understand and prevent these things from happening, we are inherently engaging to some extent with victims, even though we're taking a perspective of reducing the likelihood from perpetrators. But ultimately, I mean, it is a... Um, so this book is intentionally taking the view of you, the reader, as being capable of terrible things. And so it's basically looking almost entirely at perpetrators of wrongdoing, but perpetrators also being potentially you. So that's the whole point. Um, it's not a book about victims per se, and that's, again, intentionally. But that's not to say that we don't... I mean, we should definitely be engaging victims of different kinds of crimes in these conversations. I do think that often, however, already for, this is of course not true for all kinds of crime, but for a lot of kinds of crime, we already have a victim focus. So the way that journalists report things is typically, oh, how terrible for the victim or for the victim's family. It's not generally, let's try and get to know the, the, the perpetrator. And so, again, really important to include victims, but th this particular book, that's not the main aim. But it's almost become, especially in media and press, they won't name the perpetrator has become a, a trope of certain news outlets that if the in New Zealand, for example, the, the shooting that happened in New Zealand, they refused to name the perpetrator because they didn't want to humanize him. They didn't want to give him a name. And this this element of dehumanization, I mean, it, where do you sit on that? Is that, is that where is that somewhere where we should be looking at? Should we not name these sorts of people who do these heinous acts? Or should we try to understand them from a human level? Should we look for the empathy or the human within those quote unquote evil people? I think with terrorism, just to contextualize that, I think we need to be very careful not to um, mix up um, dehumanizing the perpetrators with not giving them a platform. So I, I very much agree with not naming terrorists, if that, because that's the point of terrorism, is to get attention and fear for an individual and or their project. And so I think by stripping individuals of the ability to create fear or, less, or have less of an ability to create fear in line with whatever organization they're trying to push, I think that can be a very useful exercise. And I think that journalism is often complicit basically in, well, in, in allowing terrorism to be effective which it's very difficult because obviously you want to talk about the atrocity, but you also don't want it to have more of an effect because, because talking about it is the point, right? That's why it happened in the first place. So I think we need to be very careful not to, or to try and diminish platforms as much as possible while still trying to talk about the impact on victims. And I think that can sometimes be achieved by not talking about the perpetrators directly or their, their causes. Um, that's a bit of an unusual case though. Because, because it's usually for press, whereas most other crimes are not committed for press attention. If anything, that's a downside very much. Um, and so I think with overall, we should definitely try to see the humanity in every single individual. Um, and counterterrorism, and this is where it gets tricky, counterterrorism, I mean, that is where we as, a West, as Western countries have justified some of the worst evils, if you want to use that word, uh, that I think we've perpetrated in recent times. I mean, Guantanamo Bay, from torture to attempt, I mean, we have justified incredible harm in the name of counterterrorism, And we need to be very careful, again, not to do it because they're not really human beings. 
And I think that's sometimes the root of it is that it's, again, it's justified because we're on the side of God, they're on the side of evil. Let's, let's lighten the subject just a <laughs> slight little bit. You mentioned cute aggression. Now, the interesting thing about cute aggression is you describe in the book. Firstly, p- please describe what cute aggression is. But what's interesting is it reveals our innate uh, tendency towards potential evil. <laughs> what is cute aggression? If you've ever seen a cute animal, I, I basically I have this every time I walk by a dog. Um, small so, dogs. Small dog, any dog really. Uh, old dogs, new dogs, puppies, doesn't matter. New dog, what's a new dog? Um, but I walk by a dog and basically I get this sort of, in my, there's deep in my feeling, this desire to just go, go oh, or just like squeeze it really hard or maybe just, uh, I have this towards my partner Um, Now, when I talk to other people, I'd say about a third of people are like, yeah, I totally understand what you mean. And a third of people go, what are you talking about? And a third are just curious. Um, But I have this with my partner that I just want to squeeze him a little bit or just like just like gently just hit him a little bit. Uh, Not in an intimate partner violence way, but I just I have so many so many feels and I just want to get them out. And uh, sometimes that expresses itself in sort of pseudo violent acts. Um, what is that about? And uh, this book very much is also an exploration of my own dark side or my own tendencies that I don't understand that on the surface look really bad. Uh, And cute aggression, it turns out, is actually um, a really normal thing. So cute aggression happens when you are overwhelmed by, as it suggests, cuteness or something really positive, and your brain is... shoots out the opposite emotion to try and get your brain to not short circuit. So it's too cute. What's the opposite of taking care of or nurturing something? Aggression or violence. Now that's called a dimorphous display of emotion. It's the same when you, if you've ever been to a funeral and you find yourself smiling or laughing or you're nervous and you're smiling or laughing, or maybe you're actually really happy. You're at a, you're at a wedding, you're getting married or your friend's getting married and you start crying. That's the same thing. That's also a dimorphous display. It's your body shooting out the opposite emotion to try and get your brain basically to not have too much of one emotion and it shoots out the opposite. And so it's actually not a form of aggression, it turns out. It's a pseudo aggression. Um, But I think it's one of those things that a lot of us, I feel like when you have these moments, you go, oh my God, am I... Am I a terrible person? Am I, am I capable of actually hurting? Some people have this with babies. I don't have, any, I, I don't have a, a positive, cute response to babies, uh, just generally, but a lot of people do. And uh, when they see babies, the same thing. They're like, I just want to pinch your cheeks and squeeze you a little too hard. And I think it can scare people. And so how do we lift that? Well, the other type of aggression that you cover is not just cute aggression, but passive aggression as well. That reveals something about the ways in which we try to allow ourselves to be a little bit evil. Yeah, passive aggression is how good people rationalize hurting each other um, in relationships particularly, um, in small ways. So again, moving up sort of one step from pseudo aggression to the sort of first step into actual aggression is typically passive aggression, which... I mean, we're all probably familiar with someone being passive aggressive to us. And most of passive aggression has to do with not doing things, right? So we can rationalize as the person administering the passive aggression or acting on it. We can say, well, I didn't do anything. Even though we know that not, I mean, everything as small as, you know, your partner asks you to load the dishwasher, you intentionally don't do it because you know it's going to annoy them. That's an act of aggression, even though it's a very minor one. And now the question that arises from that is why do we want, why are we aggressive to the people who we possibly love most in the world? And uh, basically it's because aggression is an inherent human feature and they're around all the time. And so unfortunately they also end up being the targets of most of our aggression, of for many people of the most violent acts they engage in, for many people of the biggest lies they tell. They're just really convenient targets and there's a lot at stake. Um, I mean, to level up even one more, I mean, sometimes is it just sadism? I mean, the the easiest excuse for some people to um, excuse certain evil acts is, oh, that evil person must enjoy it. They must get a sadomasochistic kick out of it. I mean, is there any any truth to the science of that? I mean, you explore some of that in this book. 
I do. Sadism is an interesting concept because I think a lot of us do inherently associate sadism with evil. So it's the sort of idea that it's not just someone who's done something wrong that makes them evil or really, really bad. It's someone who's enjoyed hurting someone else. So it's not just instrumental. It's not just to get something, typically. It's to get something, but also I enjoyed it. And one of the things that, especially in movies, we link with evil perpetrators and the evil character is a, a certain look, and I have a whole chapter on creepiness. And also there is, there is in fact a test, are you creepy? Because I think one of life's great questions is, do creepy people know that they're creepy? And you can find out. Um, <laughs> or they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, so looking at someone, quite often you can tell who is going to be the bad person in a movie. But the other thing is that when they do acts of aggression or harm, there's often a laugh. There's the evil laugh. And it's this idea is that it's, it's showcasing how much they're enjoying the situation. And there's someone called Baumeister who talked about what's called the victimization gap, which is that because, A, for people who are thinking about crimes, it's much easier to picture themselves, so as us, to picture ourselves as the victims than the perpetrators. And so within that, we are empathizing, we're lending basically all of our empathy to the victim and the pain and suffering that's being caused to them. And if we think about from that perspective what the perpetrator might be getting out of it, which is almost never going to be proportional to the amount of suffering they're causing. So they're almost never going to have as much joy or gain as this, the victim is going to lose. So there's this inherent gap that you're not getting as much as the other person's losing, so it's totally out of bounds. And so you look at them, and then there's this idea that if they're laughing on top of it, there's even more of a, an imbalance, there's even more of a, a problem in terms of, of, of the, the, the gap that's, that's being established here. And we assume that it's, um, again, this sort of showcasing, their sadism showcasing the, their evil nature. But there's been a number of science experiments that have shown that a lot of people, when put into situations where they're asked or where they choose to hurt other participants, there's lots of ethically approved studies that have violence in minor ways, um, and some that are more severe that were done in the 60s, um, that we don't do anymore. Um, but they're basically most people, or many people, when they're put into the situation where they're hurting somebody else, end up showing smiles or laughter. And that's because dimorphous displays, basically. That you are suffering because the other person's suffering. And your body is, again, pumping out this opposite emotion. So it's probably not actually, at least for most people, an indication of sadism. And yet we have this classic association with the evil laugh and with that being clear sign that the person's enjoying themselves, which you need to be very careful about. Well, let's, let's talk about the science of some of this stuff. So what is it about human beings that make them capable of some of these horrible acts? Um, I think, I mean, there's a couple of processes. One is de-individuation. So one is seeing yourself as part of a group. And now there's been some neuroimaging studies on this. Um, there's also been a lot of just social science research that puts people into groups and gets people to identify in different ways where you're basically saying, okay, now you are part of this group and you're going to act aggressively or take advantage or steal from, in a research setting, this other group. Um, now it's basically us versus them. I mean, this is a classic thing we do in just as humans as well. And it's also the classic strategy that happens during wartime is that there's this clear group mentality of we are fighting them, whoever they are. And that's been since we were tribes probably, that we've had this, we are an item, we are an entity, and I am acting in the name of we, of us, not just as me. And so that absolves me to some extent of my responsibilities. And if we are deciding that we're going to attack them, I don't need to carry that whole responsibility and the moral dilemmas that come potentially with engaging in that. I've absolved myself of that into the group. I've outsourced my morality. And I think we need to be very careful not to outsource our morality. Um, and I think that's how we can get into, again, some of the worst human atrocities that we've seen, including things like genocide, is that you just hand over things and say, well, it's not me making this decision, or, or I didn't have a choice. You always have a choice. That's, that's just never accurate. I agree that there are situations where those are more limited or where your own life is at stake, but ultimately you do always have a choice. So de-individuation is one. Another is dehumanizing. So again, as soon as we stop seeing other 
individuals as human beings, it becomes much, much easier to hurt them. I mean, one of the excuses for evil is um, that that person must have some sort of mental quirk. They must be mentally ill. But again, there's problems with dismissing it in that way as well. <laughs> so many problems. Um, yes. Uh, so in the creepiness chapter, I also talk about mental health and mental illness and stereotypes around. Uh, and often, uh, again, here we see, unfortunately, um, I mean, in the U.S., for example, school shootings continue to be a massive issue and affect a huge number of people's lives and are an atrocious instance that continues to happen. Um, I just, I just want to say something about gun regulations here, but um, I'm Canadian, by the way. We regulate our guns much better. Um, but, but, but also half German. So also, uh, half ge also good so at gun regulation. <laughs> so right down the middle of uh, <laughs> evil and really nice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As a, oh, no. Genuinely, as a German, though, coming to terms with evil and uh, I, I mean... It is different when your us, when we, if you will, your people have been the aggressors r more recently than maybe the, the, the English. <laughs> I mean, we, I mean, we did atro atrocious things as well. Let's not, let's not forget <laughs> the East India Company and God knows what else we were doing in, in, in the service of imperialism. But, yes, but uh, I mean, <laughs> but it's not quite as recent and uh, obviously. But there is that, uh, and in conversations with with German peers of mine, there is that sort of memory baked in. It's, it's not quite epigenetic, but there is something there. I mean, it, it is evil, is there a family tie there? Is there Intergenerational? That, intergenerational ties? Oh, I mean, I think what Germany taught us, or should, taught, should have taught us, which hopefully it taught us, and we continue to remember, is that there's nothing, there was nothing specific about the Germans that made this more pos possible. The problem is that these kinds of things can happen in Western countries. That's what it showed us, is that things like genocide can happen here, not just over there, wherever over there is, in places that seem far away, both socially and ideologically and physically. No, it can happen right in the fucking middle of Europe. And that is a, that we should be taking out of Germany, out of the Nazi era, is that this is us, that this is in all of us. It's not just in... Germans. And so there was a time where basically it was just pointed at Germans and Germans were villainized. And that's actually what started some of the original social psychology experiments that we know today. So the Milgram experiment and the, so where um, people were asked, participants were asked to increase steadily the amount of voltage they were administering to who they perceived to be another participant, who they were supposed to be instructing. So they were a learner and a teacher. They were teaching and reprimanding pe the learner whenever they got something wrong on a list. And every time they made a mistake, they were supposed to increase the voltage. And the person in the other room who was actually uh, a collaborator with the researchers would scream every time and scream louder and scream louder and eventually complain of a heart condition. And, and the experimenter, if the participants said, I, I, I don't want to continue, they'd say, basically encourage them to keep going. And a lot of the participants went all the way to what they thought was killing the other participant. Now, part of the incentive for doing that kind of research initially was effectively because psychologists initially said this could only happen in Germany. And we want to prove that it couldn't happen in the United States. And then when a lot of these participants went through with it with a very, very basic form of authority, basically it showed that there was nothing special about the Germans. This is, again, back to outsourcing morality. It's back to authority. It's back to situational factors that increase our likelihood for committing harm. You also look at whether people are born evil. I mean, to tie this back to that, I mean, should we kill baby Hitler if we ever got the chance? Or is there no such thing as those early signs? I love this game. So it turns out- It's um, a long, it's gonna be a long <laughs> night. I, so going to Germany, so I speak German and I did, uh, this book actually came out first in Germany even though I wrote it in English. And I did my press tour. And the Germans do have a very different relationship with evil than other parts of the world. It is a much more serious and immediate conversation, which is good. But it turns out, would you kill baby Hitler, which is effectively in North America, at least a bit of a party game. Like a, it's almost a joke. It's like, ha ha ha, would you kill baby Hitler? Not a party game in Germany. No, they took that shit seriously. Uh, and so they kept answering it as if it was this deep moral dilemma, which I thought was fascinating. Um, but in terms of the question as to 
whether we should go back in time and kill baby Hitler. I mean, I generally think killing babies is probably a bad idea. Well, it, was, it was more of a question, of, and I agree, <laughs> but it was more of a question of Can whether people are born yes. evil. Uh, I don't think people are born evil, but I don't think people are evil at all. So I don't think people become evil or are born evil. But if we're talking about predispositions for harm, there are people who are born uh, with brains that make it more likely or easier to hurt people. And the one that everyone's most familiar with is basically the psychopathic brain. And now there's a couple of factors there. One is that we don't use the term psychopath to describe babies. We don't even use it for children or adolescents typically. But if you do have kids and you have a kid who you go, something's a bit off here, and you take them to a psychologist and they come back with this diagnosis. I'm sorry to inform you. Your child has callous unemotional traits. What they're basically saying is you have a small psychopath. Um, but it's cute aggression. Cute aggression. <laughs> there's context. There's context, which is that most kids with callous unemotional traits do not grow up to later meet the full diagnostic criteria for psychopathy. But all psychopaths, as kids, had callous unemotional traits. So basically, you lose people along the way because of social factors, because of socialization, because their brains mature and change, and they understand the rules of human behavior, and they can learn what empathy is supposed to look like, even if they don't feel it. And basically, they sidestep what could otherwise put them at risk for harming other people. So, but it does seem to be something that you're born with. So it is basically an empathy deficit, as most people would talk about psychopathy at least. Uh, there is some disagreement there. Um, but it's mostly an empathy deficit. And if you don't feel bad when other people feel bad, that makes it easier to hurt them. But most psychopaths, even people who would be diagnosed as psychopaths, do not become murderers. They do not become killers. I mean, some of them do very well in business. Um, there's actually been some research on business students. MBA students are disproportionately psychopathic. I can believe that. <laughs> Sometimes it can be an advantage to not have much empathy. Uh, but it doesn't mean you're going to hurt people in the way that we maybe think in a more traditional sense. I mean, it comes back to a nature-nurture argument almost. I mean, does it have to all be uh, nature? Is a little bit of it nurture? Can traumatized or people who are traumatized at some point in their life, can they exhibit these tendencies even if they had no early onset uh, signs within their, their just nature. Most people who commit murder or other horrible things are not psychopaths. Most people um, have a confluence of factors that are risk factors. So luckily most of us do not ever engage in murder in our lifetimes. People who do engage in mur murder disproportionately have risk factors like uh, unstable lives. They are more likely to have um, bad inhibition so basically, whether it's because of drug use or because their brains just didn't mature in quite the right way or they didn't have quite enough nutrition or various factors, they're not as good as in, at inhibiting, for example, anger and, ex and the expression of it, combined with maybe being in situations where you are deprived and you're fighting for resources more than someone who's in a higher income or higher socioeconomic status situation. So all of those things typically do come together in the perfect storm or worst storm um, to create a situation where you're going to engage in terrible things. But, of course, there are also people who, like my, well, I mean, like, like the person who sent me the letter, he, he was a, a lecturer. He was an academic person who, basically because of this one situation, because of this one false memory, engaged in this horrible thing uh, and had no, no background in violence as far as we know. I mean, is it all reducible to purely the brain. And as we're learning more about brain science and neuroscience, is that changing how we convict criminals? Is there new defense mechanisms that are being used in criminal cases to defend people against their own brain? My brain made me do it. My brain made me do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I would argue that yes, everything is your brain. Every thought, every decision is your brain. Um, but I do still think we have free will. So again, Everything is your brain, but there is a sense of free will within the brain. So the brain has free will. Um, so I'm not a determinist in the, in the sort of very, very fundamental sense that anything goes and your brain's just freestyling it. Um, but I, I don't think that we can point at things even like psychopathy and say this should be a mitigating factor. I think that we need to be... So certainly it isn't being 
It, it's been attempted to be used that way. As far as I know, it's never successfully been used as a mitigating factor in a criminal trial, so the, the, a diagnosis of psychopathy. Um, I mean, even brain damage is very difficult unless you have a massive personality shift that is in the right direction. And even there, it's very, very difficult. Well, we've seen those cases where there's mm. been massive trauma to the, the head or there's been a, um, cancerous tissue within the brain that personality changes and now it's being used as a justifiable or at least tried to be used as a justifiable defense. Again, though, mitigating factor. So, I, And for some extreme cases where basic... And it's, just, it's so difficult to find a causal link between a specific thing in the brain and a specific behavior, that's, it's so hard to pinpoint that. Um, and so with that come risks, but I think as a mitigating factor, a tumor where we know that there's been a massive personality change and we know that that personality change went away when the tumor was removed, which there have been a couple of cases like this, maybe we should take that into account. But even there, you, just because you are more aggressive, it doesn't mean you had to act on it. And so I don't think it should ever eliminate responsibility as far as I'm concerned. Well, let's, let's talk culturally about some of this interest in, in evil and villainy and what we're seeing with Netflix and the rise of the uh, Ted Bundy documentary and Making a Murderer and this, this recent interest, especially in, in North America, of the murder documentaries, of these, these new genre of um, especially podcasts, serial, things like that, where we, we're fascinated by this, these sorts of people. I mean, why do you think that is? I mean, you could even take it further and say uh, the success of the fire documentary. It basically is, is corporate greed and corporate evil and how that all falls apart, where you're lying to people on a large scale for financial gain. Uh, and I mean, there's things like Finding Neverland where we talk about... Um, R. Kelly and... R. Yeah. And R. Kelly, exactly. I mean, there's been a whole... Ex I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even just contain it to murder. I mean, I think we are really across different kinds of things that we might call evil uh, in, these, in these kinds of really, really popular series right now. I think that, again, it, it's natural to want to understand why, but this is where we need to be careful, why other people do bad things. I think there's a natural fascination. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's scary. It's interesting. It's maybe worrying, but we also sometimes like when we drive by a train or a car crash, we also look. I mean, you still want to see what's happened and try to get a picture of sort of the situation, even if it's something terrible. Um, but again, we need to be careful not to treat it as something over there and just see it as a sightseeing effort into the world of evil instead actually internalize it and say, what does this mean about me? Um, and I think sometimes or often we fail to do that. I mean, is, is that process of othering partly the reason why it's usually men who perform the most violent crimes and yet the statistics on watching documentaries is, is all women yeah. watching these documentaries about these people committing or these men committing violent crimes. I mean, is, is that part of that othering process or is there something else going on there? Oh, the, the, I mean, now we venture into, so I talk about uh, murderabilia and I talk about um, Murder, sorry, what was that? murderabilia. murderabilia. Uh, so in the book, I talk about our fascination with evil and when that goes extreme. And we've all heard about um, people writing love letters to, to murderers in prison. That's, that's, I feel like at this point, almost common knowledge that sometimes women, uh, mostly women, will write to mostly men in prison and declare their love for them and effectively say, uh, will you marry me? And people will get married to people they've met while in prison via mail. Um, and sort of why does that happen? And some hypotheses around this, so some researchers who study this say that basically it's because th there's two sides to it. And one touches very quickly on the most, the most toxic of masculinity, um, but basic saying that this is the ultimate expression of maleness, of, of dominance, of being able to, especially murder, because it's usually murderers, um, of, of getting away with something so aggressive. But then there's the other piece of it, which is basically transgressing and the, the almost bravery that can be assigned to someone who dares to go against society's norms, even if that involves being a serial killer. So it's, it's interesting how this can flip into almost a fandom. And on top of that, of course, again, the media does play a role as well in basically treating serial killers as overnight celebrities. I mean, their faces are everywhere. I mean, Canada has had a, a, a 
a more a quite recent serial killer. And I mean, you can't you can't walk through a shop without seeing his face somewhere. And it's been highly critiqued, and it should be critiqued. But that's the reality. And so people people are attracted to celebrities. They're attracted to fame. And so that can be another draw. But murderabilia goes one step further than that even, which is not just maybe falling in love with the people who perpetrate the crimes, but falling in love with the stuff that they have or the stuff that they make. For example, buying their toenails or like toenail clippings or buying art that they make in prison. So there's a whole subculture of murderabilia where you can buy things that mostly murderers have made out of various creative processes that they have in prison, sometimes involving their own bodies in various ways, uh, sometimes not. Um, and you can buy these things on an online marketplace. <laughs> so it's You seem to know a lot about this, Julia. Uh, <laughs> I think you get sent stuff. I mean, in the book, you get, sent get sent paintings stuff. and... Um, yeah, I did get sent a painting. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, oh, fuck, yeah, that is, <laughs> that <laughs> is murderabilia. <gasps> never thought about that. I've, I've been sent a piece of art from prison, uh, which I never until this moment considered murderabilia, but basically is, because it came from and a And you murderer. have it positioned in the middle of your desk, apparently. <laughs> Not anymore, but I did. Uh, yeah. um, it's a picture of a flower. Anyway, um, it was to the guy who thanked me for then sending me, sending him my book. Um, but yeah, murderabilia. But it's again, it's that fascination of why does this happen? What does it mean? How does it work? And maybe an admiration for the process. This is another thing, especially for serial killers, where it's like, how did they get away with it? And it's just like a good heist movie when people break into a, the Louvre and steal a, a big piece of art. Why do we like watching that? Because it's fascinating to see how they could do it and get away with it. And there's, there's an admiration of the process sometimes. Again, not to justify it, not to say it's okay, but I think that helps to explain why people are fascinated. I, I know you're an avid user of, of Twitter, and I wonder if you were involved in the debate around Ted Bundy and how hot Ted Bundy is, and the, now the fact that High School Musical's Zac Efron is playing Ted Bundy, this, this weird dimorphous debate that is happening on Twitter is with regards to how people feel about that is... is Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, basically the debate is around glamorizing or um, making this world seem sexy. Um, but the reality is that, uh, I mean, serial killers often don't, or almost never, in fact, look like serial killers, right? I mean, in the sense that the reason they get away repeatedly with murder is because they don't set off our creepiness radars in the same way, typically. And so they're not on people's radars. They're not noticed. They're perceived as either pro-social members of society or at least kind of neutral. And so also, quite a few of them are really attractive. And so Ted Bundy was attractive, and that probably helped him A, lure victims, and B, get away with it. In Canada, we have um, a couple who are referred to as the Ken and Barbie killers, Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo. And they were very attractive. And that's why it worked. That's why people were willing to go with them to their house and to stay there and then become victimized. And then on the other hand, again, why they weren't on people's radars when people went missing. So I think we need to be careful not to scrub that because I think that in and of itself can be a risk factor that our creepiness radar is go off when they shouldn't. So just because someone's unattractive, for example, we might go, oh, they look, they're creepy. We, we shouldn't go near them. And just because someone's attractive, we sometimes go, oh, you know, we shouldn't represent them this way. <laughs> I mean, we do need to be careful not to glamorize it, but we also need to be careful not to forget that this is one of the reasons why it's effective. I mean, is, is there something darker going on there as an audience member? Is it almost a, a hunger to witness a form of violence that's baked into our history. I mean, we used to turn up to public executions mm. a couple of hundred years ago and we don't have anything similar to that other than that sort of gross out media. You, you cover in the book how violent imagery, uh, Stephen Pinker's arguing the world's less violent and yet violent imagery is on the rise in terms of TV and film. Maybe. I mean, it could be cathartic. It could be that we are seeking a, a, a safer, non-actually violent way to explore these violent thoughts that maybe were more physically manifest in front of us when we went to public executions or sort of gladiator stuff, whatever. I mean, there's been so many times in history where we've enjoyed and watched people be tortured and humiliated and, and murdered. But do um, we need to enjoy it? Do we need to exorcise it? Do we need, it? It? No, do we we need, need to, like an exorcism from to get rid of it. the body? To get rid of it, to get rid of that 
get, get rid of our, our own feelings or get rid of the fact that we do this? The fact that we do this. So should we make media less violent? No, we, are we obsessed with the violent media as a form of exorcism away from the fact that what you're arguing in the book is we will have that little bit of evil within us and witnessing it externally from us stops us from committing. Do you think there's correlation there? I don't or? think so. Um, so I don't think so. I, I think that, um, so there's, <laughs> I've heard a compelling argument that in recent history, one of the correlations between, or inverse correlations between violence and um, and anything else is basically the introduction of the internet. So basically the argument is that we started being, spending more time at home and we had more stuff to do in our houses, so we didn't go outside as much, so we didn't hurt each other in violent, in physically violent ways as much. Um, now, just like with that though, cybercrime, which I have a whole chapter on, uh, is one of the least discussed things when we talk about evil and is the single greatest source of crime right now. It's just that we don't categorize it within the same space. We don't think of it as violence. We don't think of it as, even if it's identity theft, even if it's destroying people's lives, even if it's actually killing people, like when the NHS gets hacked and gets shut down for a couple of days, it's letting people die, right? Um, but we don't think about that as evil, typically. We still think about someone going into one other person and potentially hurting them. Um, so I, I'm not sure that, I think it's mostly that we're more distracted now, not that we have catharsis through violent images. I think that just because we're exposed to a lot, we need more and more. We, there is a, there is a uh, basically it, it starts losing its effectiveness, right? I think is more the issue, is that we've all seen lots of horrible pictures at this point. So to get our attention, you need more horrible pictures. And so it just pushes it up and up and up. But I don't think it's cathartic in that sense. Let's look a little bit on that cybercrime piece, because with cybercrime, as you cover it in the book, it's the only sort of crime where we're very quick to blame the victim. With the WannaCry, <laughs> with the wanna yeah. cry, for example, you, you, you cover that in the book. And I wonder if you could explain what your, your argument there is. It's unfortunately not the only sort of crime where we're very quick to blame the victim. Um, I mean, basically... Anything involving sex, we're also very quick to blame victims. Um, but in terms of online, we almost always, whereas with other types of crime, we sometimes or we just proportionately blame victims. With online stuff, it's basically, why didn't you update your software? Why didn't you have a better password? Why didn't you? I mean, even the way that your bank, if you do, I, I recently had uh, my information, like someone did a, a transaction on my card no idea how. Uh, it was a small transaction, but it got caught. I got called and basically got reprimanded. And I consider myself a very conscious online person. And I have a lot of passwords and they're all very safe, but yet it obviously can still happen. Um, and it was even the bank was blaming me. And I was going, come on, guys. Um, and so why do we do that? And I think it's A, because we, I think we still don't really understand cybercrime, a lot of us. Um, and it's, I think we don't understand how unsafe we all are and how easy it is to ruin each and every one of our lives um, if you have basic technical know-how online. Um, it's just we spend so much time. It's, our, it's a new place where we hang out and there's basically endless victims and it, all it takes is a few people to target you specifically or one person to target you specifically in that sea of people and to take advantage of it. Or is it the fact that the dehumanization level is so high when you can't see or physically touch the, the victim? I think that's part of why cybercrime is so common. Um, so I think that cybercrime is easy to commit. Same as online trolling. Why do we say things to people online that we would never say to their faces? I think that's a reasonable question. I think it's an important question to be asking right now. Um, and the reason is basically because it's a flat experience. It's two-dimensional. You don't have the real repercussions of a human being standing across from you who's got real emotions, who's reprimanding you, who's sad if you say something bad to them. You don't get any of that. You don't even see them as a real human complex human being. You just see them maybe as an avatar or one photo, which isn't three-dimensional. And so it's easier to dehumanize them. It's easier to transgress. And I think the same is true to some extent, at least for cybercrime. And the other problem with cybercrime is just that it's so much easier to do things at scale. You don't need to physically be in the same place as your victim. You can be on the other side of the world and you can attack 50, 100, 50,000, 50 million people at once. Let's, let's also talk about artificial evil 
I mean, can AI be evil? And, and the, the case study you cover in the book is Microsoft's Tay robot, which really was a product of human beings being horrible to a non-human entity, this, this artificially intelligent Twitter robot. Could you talk a little bit about what really was going on there? What, what does that reveal about who we are as collective Twitter? If you're not familiar with Tay, uh, Tay was a, um, an AI that was created by Microsoft and it was released on Twitter and it was supposed to mimic a young woman online. And the idea was it would learn from people who tweeted at Tay. And again, it was supposed to be sort of a gender neutral, but it was mostly supposed to be a female. It also had a female avatar, I believe. Um, a, a female entity. And people would tweet at Tay and then they'd write something. And the idea would be that Tay would start to learn how people talk to Tay and then respond and change. So the algorithm meant that it would change what it said based on <laughs> what was tweeted at it. Um, now, as you can imagine, um, basically, immediately, people uh, tweeted profanities at Tay and terrible, terrible racist and sexist and homophobic things at Tay um, because they could, frankly, and because the internet is filled with 14-year-old boys. Um, and, well, and as we just said, and lots of other people who behave badly online. And within 24 hours, Tay had to be taken down because it was basically threatening to kill humanity <laughs> and justifying the Holocaust. So, I mean, it was, it, it was, it was a, an absolute failure of how technology uh, could be socialized online. And the responses were hilarious as to how people said sort of basically, it takes a village. And if this is the village raising our, our AI, um, you know, we're all doomed. And, you know, how, what does this mean also for children online? And what does this mean for how we treat each other and what the Internet world looks like and what that might have for social consequences, both online but also in the real world? Um, whether Tay was evil, I mean, she certainly acted or said things that one might perceive as evil. Um, I don't think that currently, I mean, we don't have artificial general intelligence right now. So we don't actually have... We basically have machine learning, let's be honest. I mean, the, the world of tech talks about AI a lot. I, I'm in the world of tech right now. I have a startup as well, uh, where we use a chatbot to help people report harassment and discrimination. Whole nother conversation. But I have a lot of conversations about artificial intelligence, and basically none of it's actually intelligent. We use the term because it's a sexy term, and because it looks intelligent to users, but it's not. Uh, it's algorithms, and it's very specific things that we tell it to do, and then it does it. Um, with evil, I think, or even just responsibility, culpability, agency, you need to be able to make your own decisions. And we are very far from proper AI that can actually make its own decisions beyond the sort of black box, which we're probably all, we are hearing a bit more sort of deep learning, where it's sort of you program something to do something, it then goes off and you don't really know what happens in between, and then it comes out to the results. So it somehow gets at the intended result, but you're not entirely sure how it got there in between. Um, and so it's making some decisions there, but not really, like mi minor pathways. And uh, I think until we have proper decision making, until we have proper intelligence, not, you can't be culpable, so you can't be evil. So... Could it be evil in the future? Maybe. If we ever, ever actually achieve general artificial intelligence. So, so, so what you're saying is we shouldn't just be worried about cute aggression, but we should be worried about circuit aggression <laughs> as well. We should be kind to our uh, non-human AI. <laughs> Your future overlords. <laughs> future overlords. I mean, before we send it to audience questions, I just wonder when it comes to thinking about technology and how it intersects with, with some of the themes that you've covered in this book, is deviation sometimes a driver for technological innovation? You look at the history of the internet and the deviant acts that were done on the internet or, or through the internet or enabled certain things on the internet, and they've driven most of some, many of the innovations that we see today. I mean, the, the history of porn is the history of streaming video. It it's gave us the history of the internet. It gave us streaming video and <laughs> arguably it gave us uh, uh, the broadband, and you look at um, uh, Researchers such as Trudy Barber here in the UK, the UK's leading cyber sex, but she tracks how human <laughs> deviation was the thing that led to certain forms of technological innovation. Should we almost embrace our dark side? Could we find something very useful um, and, 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 and um, possible from embracing our, our, our dark side? <sighs> 
Yes and no. So I think that there is a couple of things we need to do. One is that we need to recognize that we all are capable of terrible things. So we need to recognize that we all have a dark side and it's a very, very dark side potentially. Right now it might be a little bit dark, but it can get darker. If you're in a crisis, if you're in a bad situation, if suddenly war breaks out, if Brexit happens and the end of the world happens, hypothetically, um, then you know you don't know how you might act. So just recognize that you have that darkness inside you and be prepared and think about it when times are good. Be like a squirrel, like take those nuts and look at them and investigate them and then hide them and put them somewhere where you need them so that you're prepared for the worst of times and you have your nuts ready. That doesn't make any sense, but you've got your nuts ready <laughs> to go. But you got all the nuts. The evil <laughs> people are going to come steal your nuts. And <laughs> you've got your competence nuts. You're like cognitive, inf anyway, your information nuts stored away. Um, so you can eat them. I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm continuing. I'm keep, keep digging. Um, <laughs> Julia's vision of the end of the world. <laughs> Lots. Us with their nuts. Um, by the way, have any of you started stockpiling? <laughs> no. no? Always been stockpiling. Oh, it's a whole nother conversation. Um, I, I, I've stockpiled oat milk and coffee. Is that, is that reasonable? Anyway. Um, <laughs> oat milk. Oat milk. N oh, because uh, if the if if Brexit happens and I can't get my oat milk, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> this is a very <laughs> this is a very, very nut specific. based Armageddon. This is a uh, Armageddon or whatever it's going to be in your in your oats, oats. your mind. Yeah, don't even oat don't milk. even. Um, so so I've stockpiled my my nuts and my oat milk and my yep. Um, the other things that we need to recognize. So there's two more things. So the first one is we all have a dark side. The second one is that we. Uh, there, it, it's part of being human. Like having dark thoughts, having murder fantasies, for example, having aggression, having even pieces of violence and the capacity for deviance, is, it, that's a fundamental human characteristic. So it's not inherently bad. But again, it's to not absolve you of the responsibility of the decisions you still need to face. And this is the second piece, is just never m outsource your morality. Remember that it's still your decisions you're making and that you need to be very conscious of which path you're going down um, when you make those decisions. And then the third thing is that, yeah, sometimes deviance can be a good thing. So if you live in a totalitarian regime and you act in ways that are subversive to the state, other people might act, label you a terrorist, they might label you evil, but what in those situations you might be the one who's actually fighting for your morality at least and you are doing something potentially beneficial for humanity overall. So I think that deviance in and of itself can also be helpful. It can also be the foundation of things like creativity. I mean, being deviant in a much more, much looser sense is breaking rules. And breaking rules is how we get to creativity, is how we get to new innovations, it's how we get to crazy porn online that leads to innovations in technology. Um, I mean, there are interesting routes that we can follow that not all deviance is bad. And I think that's probably the third thing. So that deviance isn't inherently bad. So on that note, do we have any deviant questions? Uh, we have an audience mic. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'm struggling to see you. Very mind hard to see you. Raising the audience light. Uh, and just wait for the mic uh, when it's coming to you, um, just because we're recording this. Uh, just gentlemen just here. Thank you ever so much. Uh, gentlemen just here. So it was hard, hard to disagree with any of that. I mean, it seems perfectly sensible most of it, but I, I couldn't help thinking that a lot of it isn't really evil. A lot of what we're talking about isn't really evil. I'm thinking, I'm from Northern Ireland. I lived through the Troubles. Uh, some of the things that happened there are beyond comprehension, like in other places in the world where there have been really terrible, terrible conflicts. And... At that level, it's hard to accept what you're saying. I mean, I, I, I generally accept it, but it's hard to accept that I am capable of that. Those really, really serious premeditated torture of the most horrific kind. So that's one part. The second part is, is there absolutely no social use in having a category of evil? You know, it, it, that, the stuff that's really beyond the pale, is there really no socially useful purpose in having that I mean at the moment it seems to be abused you know it's used just casually for all kinds of shit so if it was used more sparingly and more particularly would it not have a social function 
Um, I, I'll start with the second question. I think uh, it's a great question, and it's actually one that is hotly debated by philosophers, is do we need the term evil? Do we need the concept of evil? And um, most philosophers come to the conclusion that we do. Um, everyone from Hannah Arendt to Giddes Arendt, I, I like highlighting women in this area, um, they, they, they will still use the word evil, even if it's the banality of evil, even if it's sort of evil in context, um, it's evil. They use the term and they mean it as the worst possible opprobrium. They mean it as something that's more than very, very bad. And the idea behind that is that it is basically an easy way to communicate, A, I think this is a terrible, this is the worst kind of thing people can do, because it does communicate that quite quickly, um, and B, to say nobody should be uh, let off the hook for these kinds of behaviors. Now, while I agree that language can be beneficial with that, I think what, unfortunately, and this is why I don't like the term and why I don't agree with the term, and I don't think we need it, is that I think it almost always shuts down the conversation. I think that evil is the end of a conversation. Evil is what you arrive at when you say, why did the person or this organization or this terrorist act happen? Because, because they're evil, full stop. As if that's some sort of explanation, right? Which it's not. And it doesn't allow us, it doesn't encourage us to explore further why they actually, why these individuals actually engage in this behavior. And again, how we can actually potentially prevent it from happening. So for me, I think it's, we, it's just abused as a lazy term to end conversations that we need to be having. And so that's why I would say, so my advice would be to not use the word, to instead try to describe what it is you mean or that you disagree with. And if other people use the word evil, ask them what they mean. Because a lot of people actually really struggle to define what about something. Besides saying, oh, it's bad, it's terrible. Go on, what about it? And then you can start to have a good discussion. Uh, and so that's my issue with the term evil. But it is definitely debated. Um, and there are definitely people who disagree with me. The other issue, I was actually in Northern Ireland recently. Um, and I was giving a talk at um, the big jail in the middle of town, which is now an event center. Which used Dublin. to no, I'm uh, yeah. uh, which used to house some of the worst people during the troubles. Appar sounds right. That sounds right. Uh, that's not in Belfast. No, it, it was called the jail. I can't remember the name of it. But it was apparently all I was told is that the it. Oh yes, yes, yes. That's the one, Crumlin Road. Uh, Crumlin Road, um, which I didn't actually realize the extent to which it was associated with the Troubles until I was there on stage, and it was pointed out to me, and it was told me that it was haunted, and apparently there, there were house peoples from both sides of the Troubles, and so there were lots of com there's lots of conflict within the jail itself as well, which, again, given the recency of the conflict, um, I find that people in Northern Ireland, and I presume also in Ireland, uh, have a very different relationship with evil than people, for example, in London. It is very different when firsthand you've had family members involved in um, potentially uh, highly problematic and violent activity, uh, or you've had victim, people in your family who've been victimized. So I think that I found it fascinating to be there. And I actually thought that it was seen as, I, I found it more empathetic that people sort of went, yeah, obviously everyone's capable given the right circumstances uh, of doing terrible things because I've seen it firsthand. I've seen people I love do things that even they themselves would say are in, inherently bad, but they justified it for being necessary or for the right reasons. Most people didn't, it, it, absolutely right. But I still think that the contact is higher than with a lot of people in, in London, for example, right now. And I at least found that the empathy was um, higher. And, and it was, um, I, I enjoyed speaking with people in Northern Ireland about it, because um, it was a special kind of relationship. Um, yeah, again, with, I don't know where to go with this beyond that. But I think that uh, we still need to be careful not, and, and I'm not saying that everyone's equally likely to engage in terrible activity or terrible behavior. It's just that I think we need to all be willing to engage in the at least hypothetical exercises to think what could lead us to become terrorists, for example, um, so that we can identify and try to empathize and understand uh, people who have chosen that pathway a bit better. Any other questions, Zuzu? Question just here? I see a phone. That's helpful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, 
fabulous book. Really enjoyed reading it. Really well researched. Did you find any evidence uh, that countered what you're talking about? Any confirmation bias? And the other one, since Original Sin, um, don't you think that what you describe as evil is simply human emergent behavior? I'm not biased. <laughs> no, I wasn't saying you were, but I'm I was kidding, saying I'm there kidding. is confirmation We're all bias. biased. We're all biased. Um, I, uh, did I come across, I, I did try very hard to ask open questions and then go looking for the answers. Um, when people asked me when I, while I was writing the book what the premise was, I said, it's a book about evil. We'll see what my decision is at the end. So like whether there's such a thing, I was basically, a, I had the notion that probably e evil is not a useful construct, but I was willing to test it as far as possible, which is why I also use examples uh, like Jeffrey Dahmer, where I basically tried, or, or human trafficking or, or sex slavery, I tried to pick basically things that I felt I couldn't just, like, I couldn't understand. I couldn't even begin to understand. And I found so difficult to digest that I said, well, if my hypothesis is correct, I need to try and digest those things because otherwise this is, this is for, for naught. Um, so, and it, and it does become more difficult when you go to the extremes. Um, but was I, I mean, again, there's, there's lots of people I'm sure who disagree with some of the, well, A, some of the experiments in the book. I talk about Zimbardo's prison experiment, for example, which has come under a lot of critique. I do mention that it's come under critique. It still has informed the dialogue tremendously. So I still think it's, imp I think it would be weird not to have it discussed in the book. But on the other hand, I appreciate that there are some issues with some of the social psychological experiments that I talk about. Um, so there's some issues there with regard to sort of generalizability with the quality of the research, but that's an issue in sciences in general, not just in my book. Um, then there's issues with regard to, I, I am always going to look for the humanity in people. Um, I am not willing to accept that monsters exist and that is a bias. Um, but I think that I found enough research that I felt did support that, that I felt comfortable rejecting the rest. <laughs> Basically. What was the second question? Uh, on the idea that since the original sin was defined and we promulgated throughout society for the last 2,000 years, that actually evil is the result of human emergent behavior. So people like Jeffrey Dahmer actually are the result of lots and lots of little bits that have combined together to create something devastatingly large in the true sense of emergence. As, so as in, could Jeffrey Dahmer not have existed 2,000 years ago? Or what's the... No, no. no. That um, actually that people who we define as evil are actually the result of lots of little things. Oh, I see. Um, sometimes. So again, I think sometimes we see that there's this confluence of lots of risk factors, of lots of problematic things. Um, but sometimes people just, if you will, snap and do something terrible yeah, from what seems they like. They snap as a result of one thing? Or lots of things. The straw that broke the camel's back. You know. I, I think genuinely sometimes it's just a bad decision. Or it seems like a good idea at the time, as my, my dad used to say. Um, but it's sort of this... I, I, think, I think we underestimate how quickly we can make a very terrible decision. And also the things that we then do to cover it up. So I think sometimes... I mean, it's the classic sort of... Especially in corporate situations. I mean, Volkswagen is a good example. Sort of how do we get to a situation where there's a massive cover-up of ecological basically just irre like irresponsible, irreversible destruction of the environment to levels that were just never admitted. Well, were <laughs> once they had to. Um, but how did we cover up for so long so much devastation? Um, and it's basically, I think, just lies got, got out of control. And then more and more people covered up and more and more people are involved and more and more bigger lies have to be told to cover up the smaller lies. And I think that sometimes that can happen. So in terms of small things adding up, I think that can sometimes be the cause. But what happens, why that first bad behavior happens, I think could just be a mistake. And I, I know that's not a comf it's not a nice explanation, but I think, I think sometimes it just is. I mean, back to the, the Volkswagen example, I, I mean, you cover that to a degree in the book, you, you say that money changes morality and it changes our adaptive preferences in the present and we allow for certain violences to occur on our behalf whether it's the the children creating our iPhones on our behalf in horrible slave conditions that are outside of our our perceptive abilities because it's outsourced in this weird sort of way I mean how does money change morality and in what ways can we 
at least try to tackle some of those problems? I think probably the most, um, so for all you good people in this room, uh, I think the most damning piece of this book actually for your identity might be the corporate chapter, which is basically saying that we're all contributing to great suffering in the world, probably, probably we all are at least, um, indirectly. By, because every time you spend a pound on something, you are voting with that pound for what is happening. So where the, was, you know, the, the production line as to what brought you that product. Um, if you're not thinking about how you're spending that money, it can be very quickly reinforcing things that you would never think you, you would certainly never do yourself, but you, could, you, you are morally against, that you think are morally reprehensible. And that's everything from, from bad or slavery-like condi work conditions, that's uh, child labor, that's, I mean, cruelty towards animals, that's a like, whole category of harm where we are creating so much suffering and doing so much damage to the environment just because we like a piece of meat. I mean, really? That, that, but we do it, and we do it every day, and we vote for that every day, and we, we decide that this is the way that we are just, we're basically just ignorant to the fact, and we don't think about it that that's what we're doing when we're buying that piece of meat or when we're buying that cheap item of clothing. Um, and basically we're all hypocrites. And I think there we, it's just about being much more conscious consumers and not assuming that, you know, money shouldn't be allowed to be a complete separation between you and your responsibility of what happens when you give people that money. I mean, if someone in front of you said, you know, again, if, if you saw even just animals kept in cages in front of you, now just uh, full disclaimer, I'm not, a vegetarian, um, I eat meat as well, and basically I just feel guilty every time I do. Um, I eat less, and I'm constantly trying to cut down, but even I am a hypocrite, because if someone had an animal in front of me in a cage and was torturing it, and then said, hey, do you want a piece? Yeah. And here, give me some money for it? I'd say, are you kidding me? I'd call, I'd call animal services. I mean, and yeah, that's what we're doing. So it's, money is this buffer or perceived buffer where we just are, it allows us to not have to think about where stuff comes from. I mean, um, I mean even on a macro scale, does, does society have this investment in this dehumanizing of others through the concept of evil? So on the macro scale, the, the entire US prison system, which is basically a massive industry. They have to define the consumers as evil, those prisoners that have to go to jail, which is the reason for the massive imbalance of men in prisons in the US is largely because it's a really good business. I'm not sure that explains the imbalance. It, ex it explains maybe why, oh, I think there's lots of parts of that that we would need to unpick to explain why crime and imprisonment is higher in the US. But um, prison, the prison system is a business in also parts of the UK. I mean, there are private prisons in the UK. We can't absolve ourselves of this. Um, it's not necessarily a bad system. It's an ethically complicated system when you're saying you're, you're financially, or someone is financially benefiting from other people committing crime, basically. Um, that's complicated. Not necessarily that, I mean, private prisons can be run more efficiently and better than government-run prisons, but there's lots of other issues and a lot of reasons why they might not and why they might, greed might overrun uh, that kind of organization and lead to a worse outcome for offenders. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I think what you were saying with the sort of corporate structures, I think what often happens there as well is that we flatten the human experience down to numbers. And so it might feel impossible to understand things like as far as human, I mean, human trafficking and human slavery, um, which is still a massive issue on the planet today, which feels like this relic of the past and isn't. Um, it, it feels impossible to empathize with a slave owner. It just, it, to me, at least, it feels impossible to put myself in that situation. But basically, they've done the ultimate task of dehumanizing those individuals and just saying that this is, this is business. This is, this is what we do, and this is how I make my money, and it's the way it has to be. But it's not all that different for someone who potentially, I mean, it is different, but it's in the same category of thinking as people who treat their employees as numbers and just as costs and treat risks to human well-being, including through drugs or through car manufacturing. They treat human lives as costs and numbers rather than as human lives. It's the same category of thinking about it on the wrong level, and it makes it, again, much easier to justify and do harm. Any other questions at all? <laughs> yeah. um, some you have the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> and then we'll go to the back. So you've asserted that everyone has the capacity to do terrible things. Mm -hmm. What's the basis of the assertion of everybody rather than some, many, or most people? Why everyone? Uh, and also, a completely separate question. We've talked a little bit about, say, 200 years ago, people watching executions or whatever. Also, a lot of, sort of medieval practices look barbaric. What's the trajectory here? Are we, are we better than we were four or 500 years ago? But the first one was, was the many and most all. I mean, better than is, seems like a, a morality judgment. Uh, but I think in terms of violence, we're definitely less violent than we've ever been, argue most people who study violence. Um, there has been a slight uptick again. So there was, it was basically a steady decrease for a while. Um, and it's gone up a bit again. But it's still way below what it would have been hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. Um, but um, for the first one, which was the many... Oh, why, why do I say that we're all capable? Because I think it's the most prudent assumption. So I think that if as soon as we give people the option to not associate people who are capable of harm, which I still think also all of us have done. Like I, I, I doubt there's a single person in this room who hasn't at some point done something that even they're ashamed of themselves or certainly that someone else has perceived or you know has been harmful to somebody else intentionally. Like that, I just, I don't think that human being exists. Um, so, so that's one reason. Um, and I think research, if you, especially if you take it as a whole, would back me up in that assertion um, that we're all capable of the worst atrocities, I think is a prudent assumption. I don't say that we're all equally likely and I also don't say that we're all equally likely at the same time. So I think that, again, if your circumstance, if our circumstances change, and let's say um, our country goes to war, suddenly we're in a very different situation. We're in, in foreign, a foreign um, psychological social space, if you will, um, and we're having to make decisions that we've never had to make before. And I think that for situations like that, that increases the likelihood that we will commit harm. Um, never mind a, a change in your personal situation, which could also have a similar consequence, that over your lifespan, you're going to have situations where you are more at risk for doing harm to others, even at more severe risk, uh, even more severe harm. But basically, on a very fundamental level, I think it's the most prudent assumption because it l allows us to, it forces us to accept that we are part of that group, because as soon as you say many or most, I guarantee you, most people will say, well, but not me, not me. It's the same with memory stuff. I mean, when I talk about false memory research and I say that as far as we can tell, everyone has false memories and everyone is capable of highly emotional, complex false memories given the right circumstances, um, basically people will say, yeah, but, but not me. <laughs> Until you investigate or they're part of a research study and then they go, oh, oh yeah, me too. Um, and it's, just, it's, it's really easy to not include us in those discussions. And I think it's much more useful, and much more engaging, and much more important to do those thought experiments and to consider it part of the human experience and to prepare ourselves for the worst, no matter who we are. And then maybe one more question somewhere near the back. So I'm struggling to see anything. But mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead if you get the microphone. Is there any research on why more, uh, whether men sorry, whether women are better at inhibiting their evil thoughts and what's the, what, is there a kind of simple answer for the reason why it seems like m men commit more evil acts than women, even if men aren't necessarily more evil than women? Um, I think the basic answer is, well, there's two, two pieces of it. Well, the first piece is that most acts that we would probably as a room consider evil or the worst possible things that people do, most of those are committed globally by men. Uh, most of those are also locally, so even here in the UK, are committed by men. So including most people accordingly who are in prison are men. Um, I mean, disproportionately. I mean, it's not even close. Um, the next question is why? Why are most of the people who, as far as we know, are committing especially violent crimes and crimes that end up with people going to prison, why are they men? Um, that question, I think, is answered, as far as I'm concerned, almost entirely by socialization. So there's a, um, a book right now called The Gendered Brain, which also, if you're interested in, in gender differences in brain structures and deconstructing some of the myths that have long been uh, 
discussed around, um, yeah, brain differences between men and women, uh, that's a great read. Um, but there's a lot of discussion right now around basically how we've used testosterone for a long time as an excuse for why men are violent. And it's just bullshit. Men are not violent because of testosterone. It's just not the case. You might have more thoughts, you might have more, even aggression, not necessarily, but most of you, I would argue in this room, I can barely see you, but I see that there are in fact men in this room. I presume most of the men in this room are not violent most of the time, uh, which suggests that even though you have testosterone every single day, you're not acting out because of your testosterone, correct? And so I think it does a disservice to men to blame testosterone because it suggests that men are inherently more violent than women. And it also does a disservice, of course, to women who are disproportionately likely, although it's still mostly men aggressing towards men, but who are also disproportionately likely that if a woman is aggressed against in a violent way, it's disproportionately going to be a man who is violent towards her. So it does a disservice to everybody. So instead, I think it's important to think about how we talk about self-control, how we reward inhibition, and how we socialize boys to not see violence or aggression or pseudo-aggressive acts like fights or fights in, I mean, not even pseudo-aggressive, but fights or um, sports that facilitate fight-like situations, if you will. I mean, hockey is a classic example, ice hockey, I'm Canadian, so that comes to mind, where it's literally actual fights next to hockey, and that was completely acceptable for a long time, as just an expression of, your, of you being upset and being frustrated that the game isn't going the way you want it to, which is crazy. I mean, we don't have that for women. That's not a viable outlet. We don't promote that. We don't, we don't really leave that as an option. And that's probably a good thing. And I think that that helps to set standards that we say that, you know, women are expected to not act on their aggressive thoughts. Whereas men, there's less of an impulse control that's effectively given to them and accepted by society. I mean, all you need to do is go around the world and see the different ways in which men behave to see, again, all those men have testosterone, but some of them are much more violent on average than men here. So again, it's not inherent to maleness. It's how we socialize boys and how we allow and understand and possibly even reward, I think, violent behavior in men. Maybe they have more testosterone. Who? In the different countries. They don't. <laughs> So yeah. before, before we start a fight, <laughs> um, I, guess, uh, I guess my final question would be, how do, we, how do we sharpen our cognitive tools to speak about the unthinkable as you have done so wonderfully in this Making Evil book? How do we, sh sorry. How do we sharpen our cognitive tools to speak about what is essentially unspeakable? I mean, the issue is the, the shame that comes with talking about these very, very difficult topics. Yeah. Um I, I mean, I think the most important thing, as you, as you just said, is to talk about things that are hard to talk about. Um, if you come across an issue that you find difficult to understand or difficult to digest, dig deeper. Look, I mean, treat it as sort of an exploration. And harness your curiosity in those moments and go, wow, this is, I can't believe this exists. I can't believe humans do this to each other. So I need to understand why, why does this happen? And then try to figure out or at least start looking for some of the causes of that kind of behavior. And it's never going to be an easy answer. It's, it's never going to be, oh, you know, psychopath, oh, testosterone, oh, just socialization. It's never, it's, it's not as easy as that. It, it is more complex than just one piece of it. Um, but it's still much more rewarding, I think, than either not thinking about it and just putting up a wall and saying, I, I don't want to go past this. I think that's really problematic. Um, and I think it's just really interesting. And it makes you, it makes you that awkward, but also most interesting person at the, at the dinner table. It's like, I want to talk about this topic. <laughs> So on that note, uh, Julia's book is available right now. You can purchase it from evil companies online or you can <laughs> purchase it from good companies and independent bookstores. I want to thank the Miranda Bar and the Ace Hotel for hosting us, for the uh, entire team of our volunteers who help, who help film and make these events possible. And if you like what we do at Virtual Futures, please find us pretty much anywhere online at Virtual Futures or just Google Virtual Futures. And I want to end with this which is the warning we end every single event with, which is the future is always virtual.
And some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please join me in thanking the incredible Julia Shaw.